The Spine of Albion. Chapter 13. The Borderlands. On the Trail of Merlin to the Firth of Forth. The march of the intellect is gradually trampling underfoot the legends, omens, and superstitions which formerly flourished in their strength amid the wild fastnesses of the land, and they are seldom talked of now but as things that have been but never will be again. John Mackay Wilson in Tales of the Borders. Land of the Brave. The wild and rugged country of Scotland has an ancient past dating back thousands of years to a period when the earliest megalithic tombs and stone circles dotted the landscape. Some of the most impressive monuments include Maesau and the Stennis circles on the Orkney Islands, Callanish stone circle on the Isle of Lewis, the megalithic stone complexes at Kilmartin in Argyll, and Macri Moor on the Isle of Arran. These early settlers were an advanced and sophisticated society derived from Indo-European stock, arriving in around 8000 BC. On the declaration of our both, uh, the Scots declared that they came from Scythia originally, which is round about the Ukraine sort of area. Much of Scotland's ancient history and oral traditions have been lost due to centuries of conflict and religious control. Yet there was a time when the early cultures of Scotland lovingly honoured and nurtured the land, which continued despite the constant threat of invasion. In time, they would be forced to continually battle with their enemies to retain their independence and freedom from foreign invaders such as the Romans, Angles and Vikings. Nennius, the 9th century bishop of Bangor, wrote that when Brutus and other survivors of Troy arrived in Britain around 1103 BC, known then as Alban or Albion, he occupied the country as far north as the River Tweed and began the task of uniting the various tribes of the Picts under his rule. According to the Welsh Brut, uh, Yins Pridian, the Isle of Prydain or Britain, had three realms, Kimrai, Alban and, I don't know how you pronounce this, Logier, I think, L-L-O-E-G-Y-R, Logier, I'm not sure. Geoffrey of Monmouth in History of the Kings of Britain, 1136, wrote that these realms were divided between the three sons of Brutus. Locrinus was given land that covered the area we know today as England, called Logria. Al... Alab... Oh man, how do you say this? Albanactus. Okay, Albanactus. Ruled over Alban, or Alba, now Scotland, and Camber was given Wales which he called Cambria. This legend was also included in the chronicle of the Alban Duan, believed to have been written around 1070 to commemorate the crowning of King Malcolm. The third of Scotland, 1053-93. Roman historians were the first to produce a written history of Scotland, which they called Caledonia describing it as wild, waterless mountains and desolate, swampy plains, and possess neither walls, cities, nor tilled field, but live off their flocks, wild game and certain fruits. Tacitus wrote that its people were aggressive, awkward and difficult to subdue, many of them with red hair and large limbs. Reminding him of the barbarians they fought against in the Rhine. Dio Cassius, writing in Rome without ever setting foot in Scotland, described the tribes as constantly forcing the Romans back behind Hadrian's wall. In fact, the Romans were continually plagued by the clever guerrilla tactics of the Picts throughout their occupation of Britain, resulting in the construction of the Antonine Wall across the Firth of Forth to the Clyde on the west coast. And when that fell, they built Hadrian's Wall above Carlisle. By the way, the same tactics that the Picts used against the Romans, Wallace used against the English. <laughs> as much as things change, they stay the same. However, far from the novel savages described by the Romans, the Picts were in fact a highly civilised culture and literate race, their kinsmen residing in Germania and Gaul. From the moment the Romans set foot on Scottish soil, its precious land became stained with the slaughter and carnage of constant conflict. The Romans described these tribes as variously fair-haired and tall and short, and swarthy, like the Iberians of southern Spain. Well, if you know the story of Queen Scudder, that shouldn't come as a surprise. Whatever their origins, these people, 
who had inhabited Scotland for centuries before the Romans invaded Britain, formed a confederation of tribes which successfully stopped any Roman attempts to completely conquer their sacred realm. Most scholars agree that the Picts were an amalgamation of different tribes that included the indigenous peoples of Scotland. No such thing, by the way, but anyway. Although many of the early sources are unreliable, it seems that the descendants of the Picts occupied the northern regions, then known as Alba, long before the Celtic tribes arrived in Britain in 700 BC. So no, the Celts and the Picts are not the same thing. Scottish historian Michael Lynch states that whatever the Picts were, they are likely, as were other peoples, either in post-Roman Western Europe or in contemporary Ireland, to have been an amalgam of tribes headed by a warrior aristocracy, which was by nature mobile. Their culture was the culture of the warrior. Lynch, 1992. Picti, the name given by the Romans to the various tribes living in Scotland, has been widely translated as the Painted Ones. Made a video about that. Check it out. When McCarty in A New History of the Picts believed that the Romans used an accepted literal form of the term Pecht, translated as the Ancestor Peoples, which was then replaced by the name Picts by the later Latin writers, having misheard the name rather than mistranslating it. The word Pecht also survived in various place names from earliest times, and it is very possible that the descendants of the Neolithic and Bronze Age megalithic builders in Scotland were the Picts, spelled P-E-C-H-T-S. Anthony Roberts in Atlantean Traditions in Ancient Britain, 1975, believed the Picts had many fairy-like magical connotations and were long credited with strange prophetic powers and worshipped the alchemical serpent power within the land. He stated that the Pechs, or Pechs in Scottish fairy lore, are variously described as small beings with long red hair, long arms, and large feet. He believes that the stone monuments were built by this ancient race of people using magical powers. Again, go on to Unslaved and check out Michael Desarian's presentation on the daemons. It goes into all of this in great detail. The Picts also had to forge an alliance with new settlers from Western Scotland, the Gaelic-speaking Scotti of the Dalriada Kingdom, having migrated from Ulster around AD 500. According to Moffat, the Western Isles were at the time already inhabited by a tribe called the Atikoti, meaning the old people, who spoke a language unrecognisable to the Picts and the Gaelic-speaking immigrants from Ireland, later known as the Scots. According to historian Ralph Ellison, Scota, Egyptian Queen of the Scots, 2006, the Scots were descended of the Egyptian princess called Scota. Although inter-tribal raids were common between these various tribes, they stood side by side to fight the Angles of Northumbria, and later the Vikings and Danes. After several intermarriages between the Picts and their Gaelic confederates, Estonians tell us that they were easily absorbed into the Dalriada kingdom by the, hist sorry, by the 11th century. Kenneth Mad Al Mac Alpin, or Kenneth MacAlpin, the son of a Dalriada king and the Pictish princess from the royal house of Fortren, created the single first single kingdom of the Scots, having proved himself against the Vikings, considered by many as the founding father of Scotland. He compares to Alfred the Great of England. MacAlpin would later move the Celtic branch from Iona to Schoon, bringing St. Columba's remains to the Pictish church at Dunkeld in AD 849. MacAlpin's descendants became the kings of Alba, and by the 11th century ruled over all of Scotland. They spanned the longest living royal family in Britain, which included Malcolm III of the House of Canmore, whose daughter Matilda married Henry I of England, and the houses of Bruce and Stuart. It is uncertain when the Pictish elite converted to Christianity, but there are traditions that place both St. Palladius and St. Ninian 
in Pickland before the Roman Catholic missionaries. It seems that their efforts hardly created a dent in the way the Pictish tribes lived their lives, the task falling to St. Columba in the 6th century to further the Christian cause. There is much debate about the fate of the Picts, having written much of their history. The later Latin scholars and Gaelic Scots allowed them to fade from our memory. Well, if you read, well, read, sorry, if you listen to um, Michael Tazarian's uh, presentation on the demons on Unslaved, I think that pretty much explains it, actually. He, he explained the whole thing, if you're going to listen. Renaming the lands as the Kingdom of Alba. Many ignore their oral traditions, relegating them to myth and legend. However, much of their ancient heritage was lost. The Vikings reportedly throwing large quantities of manuscripts plundered from abbeys into the sea from their longships. Hundreds more were looted by King Edward I of England in the 13th century. Again, this is covered in the book William Wallace Robin Hood Revealed. I've made a video about that. Uh, who sought to rob Scotland of its identity. He was known as the Hammer of the Scots, who, according to a contemporary writer, was like a common thief, to put it mildly. 65 boxes of Scottish documents were taken from Schoon Abbey and Edinburgh Castle alone, yet more was lost during the Reformation and during the later religious wars of the 17th century, Henderson 2008. I don't really believe that. I think that the copies that Edward stole were probably forgeries or fakes that they were put there because he never got his hands on the real stone so you know if you just extend that a little bit why would they give him the the real documents <laughs> they probably just created a bunch of fakes for him to steal you know i think the templars probably have the real documents and they always have had them but that's just my opinion bacardi believes that such a noble warrior society as the picts who over the centuries successfully fought off the romans angles vikings and danes to retain their freedom and independence who never have allowed their race to be completely eradicated by one single tribe. Perhaps a remnant of these people and their way of life carried on within the clansmen of the Highlands. Their descendants still walking the streets of Scotland today. Yeah, absolutely they are. Because the Picts never called themselves Picts, they called themselves Iberi. Until the Scottish archaeologists started concentrating their efforts on excavating more sites in the old Pictish territories rather than those of the Romans, we only have their own stone monuments to rely on. So yeah, I mean, the amalgamation of the different tribes into the Kingdom of Alba was, you know, at times rough, at times smooth. It was all intermarriage because they were all interrelated anyway. They're all descended from the Phoenicians at the end of the day. But, uh, you know, like I said, um, in terms of the little people, the daemons, uh, the way that the pics are described, Michael Tazarian explains exactly what happened. Go check it out on Unslaved. Thank you for listening.